here with Overtime Heroics MMA, and I'm with the one and only Jose Perez. Jose, how are you doing today, my man? I'm doing all right, all things considered, man. I'm alive. How are you doing? Yeah, bro? I'm doing amazing, dude. I'm very blessed to be talking to you today, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to come talk. Thanks, man. Yeah, so Jose, before we get into the MMA things and, and things like that, uh, when you're not in the gym sharpening those skills, what do you do in your off time? Do you have any hobbies or are you just straight focused and dialed in on the MMA career? Dude, uh, so I'm like the, my biggest value right now is my time. Um, I spend a lot of time in the gym. That's definitely due to my family. So I need to uh, hang out with them as much as possible. So basically all my off time is just hanging out with the family and trying to be a normal guy. Yeah. Uh, that takes up all of it. Yeah. And dude, I, I'm a family man. I've got two kids, so I could definitely appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And um, I did notice recently on Instagram, you mentioned you'd like to fight Blake Builder next for the championship. Is this the only fight offer you would entertain from CFFC? I just think it's the only one that really makes sense right now. Um, yeah. 35 is really an option. 55 I'd like to save for later in my career. I think to it be makes honest, sense. I felt like that should have been offered to me out the get-go. When it was Eddie Torres and Blake Builder, that should have been Eddie Torres and Jose Perez. Um, yeah. Blake Builder was a debut fighter that was just kind of there to be the B-side to Eddie Torres. And, and me personally, I just don't really believe in all that. I, I believe that we should be putting the best against the best. We shouldn't be setting up people for for an easy dub. But uh, I yeah. don't think the way they expected it to. That should have been me. So Blake Builder is definitely the only option that really makes sense. But uh, we'll see how things play out. Right. And so we kind of talked about it a little bit before we got started. But 2021 was an insane year for you. It had a lot of ups and some downs. Um, this year you've only fought the single time back in January. Is there anything behind this step back in activity or is it just a matter of finding that right fight that makes sense uh, for you right now? Well, I think when I first started, I was coming off of a three-year layoff and, and I don't really look like the most frightening individual. So I think getting fights was a lot easier. Right. No one was like hiding from, you know, the skinny Mexican guy, Jose. Uh, <laughs> But now the way of things played out, uh, it's a lot tougher to get a fight. The break was also just to see, you know, since Capaldo was coming off of, you know, what should have been his contender series, you know, opening, we figured maybe, hey, beat him. And, and there's really no rhyme or reason why I should, you know, get the, the call that he had. But um, so we were taking a step back just as far as business goes, too, just to see if, like, maybe I yeah. did enough to get the call or not. Um so not saying that that's out the window. Contender, contender series is still rolling. There's still a lot of weeks left. So, yeah, uh, just just waiting, just waiting to see. And, and now that I am getting hungry, I'm ready to fight. It's uh, now it's more on the side of like getting someone else to agree to it, and and you know someone to agree with it that makes sense. Yeah. So are you thinking more towards like a, a Dana White's contender series opportunity or? What about tough? I mean, you'd have to wait for that since they're kind of finishing up this latest season right now. But there's um, some rumors swirling around that the next season after this one is going to be really big, maybe even featuring a star like Jorge or something like that. Um, are you strictly set on Dana White's contender series or would you ever consider the ultimate fighter at all? Oh, dude, I would love the ultimate fighter. Honestly, like that's so yeah. Contender series didn't exist when I was a kid. So when I was a kid, if I wanted to watch reality TV that pertained to fighting, that was my only avenue. That was literally all I had to watch. Um, and I, that's the biggest one. I also think that as far as like fanfare goes, those guys, even if they don't necessarily win, they always make it into the show. And the winners are usually fan favorites, you know, because you actually get, uh, you know, how however many episodes to, to yeah. see them talk see them kind of operate and see who they actually are as a person and kind of start to relate to them on a personal level. So that'd be huge for me. I'm not going to lie. That would be really strenuous on the family, but the way I see it, uh, I just believe that, that I'm just better than most of the guys on this level and, and most of the guys that would get on that show. Yeah. Uh, but if you divide it up all the time and energy that it takes to go through however many fight camps, I feel like that would basically take, um 
it would be more painful for a shorter period of time, kind of a Band-Aid ripoff type of deal. Whereas right now I'm training fight to fight, but make no mistake, I'm still away from my family an insane amount, you know, and then I also have a day job. So between yeah. work and going to the gym directly afterwards, that robs them of a lot of time. So I just think that that would just give me six weeks to just centrally focus on one thing, yeah. get the job done and seal my deal. You know, that's really what, this whole thing, as far as like this level goes, is anxiety like an mf -er because there's no guarantee, you know, if I could just keep fighting and, and never get a call. You never know. Yeah. And uh, that's basically just taking that next step to where I get a contract. Someone taps me on the back and says like, that's really all I'm waiting for. Someone to come up to me and say, hey, kid, time to quit your day job. Yeah. That's all I'm yeah, and I, I think I think it's inevitable that you're going to get that call. And my question I have is, is it only UFC or are you open to everything? Bellator, PFL, or are you just kind of going the UFC route right now? Um, things change over time. So when I originally started this, uh, I believed that the greatest fighters in the world were in UFC. I still believe that, you know, I yeah. the greatest. they have the greatest concentration of greatest fighters, you know. And yeah. Less, Unless they've really fought, I can't, you know, indefinitely say that one fighter is greater than the other. But I will say, on average, the average fighter in the UFC is of a higher caliber than, you know, any other promotion. So when I first started, UFC was the uh, only avenue. But your mind kind of is a little more open when money gets involved. And, you know, I got munchkins. So if Bellator were to call me at the end of this year, and UFC did it, then Bellator it is, PFL, you know, the, basically anyone who could just pay me enough to, again, quit the day job, focus on being a better fighter, because I just think that that would open up more doors. If I could clear that schedule in the morning, yeah, I could get a session in, and what am I going to do? Train for eight hours straight like I'm working? Probably not. Um, yeah. Might be gone for however many hours, and that, that would give me, what, at least four extra hours to hang out with the family. Yeah. You know, yeah, because I've, I've trained a little bit. Usually, as you know, it's like a three, four hour like blast. And then you might do like a two a day if you're pushing it or like hit the gym like three times, you know. So you're, you, that makes a lot of sense. It would open up a ton of time in your schedule for your family and also to rest. Um, talk about the balance and how hard it is to keep that balance between working fighting and having a family because i i know it's it's tough working and trying to do some mma things but it's even harder for a fighter like you Let's talk about that is it how hard well, is it it it's not possible it's not possible um so if you're just a part-time worker or like you work a couple days a week then maybe but when you're on the extremes of both spectrum of things i'm not a uh, kind of a fighter i'm fighting legitimate talent i need to yeah. be like him full time yeah i'm robbing i'm not training as much as i should when i am preparing for fights because i have to go to work and on the other side of things i'm on the far spectrum of work i'm working five days a week you know so i it's there is no yeah. balance basically my mind belongs in one place at a time and yeah. everything else kind of falls to the wayside so I'm not being the best father I could be or the most present father is what I'll say during those training camps. So there's no balance. I'm focused on fighting and, and that's first and foremost. If my job were get, to get in the way, which I've had a job that did get in the way before and yeah. uh, I got rid of it. I went to a job that was more suited for my schedule. So basically when it's time to fight, my mind has to be essentially focused on that one thing. So there really is no balance. It's it's more yeah. of a cheater-totter is what I'll call it. Yeah. So. You know, and in my off time, I could definitely train a lot more than I do. But I'm on the extreme side of being a family man, too. I've got too much yeah. skin than a wife, so I need to be at home. So there is no balance. It really is yeah. just uh, I'm this person during this portion of my life. And then usually, like I said, this has been the longest gap. But normally, it, it, I'm fighting every other month. So I'd say yeah. one month I'm being daddy. Next month I'm being a fighter. Then the next month I'm being dad. And uh, it's it's there is no balance. There's no way to successfully balance all three things. How so does I, that, does that how does that me? make you feel? Because if you look at somebody like a let's say an NBA G League player, right? He's not in the NBA, but he's in the G League. Do you think that guy has a, a day job? 
No, he's he makes enough money from the G League to just play basketball. But these fighters who aren't in the top tier promotions are having to work. And there's the whole economics behind it. People say, well, MMA isn't as old as these other sports. There's not as many fans. But I am of the opinion that all fighters across the board could get paid more. And without trying to get you to get into that whole argument, how does that affect you? How do you feel? Is there any anger about the situation that you and your family are in? Because this is obviously a dream and it's a passion for you. And you don't want to give that up. You know, I can definitely tell from all the work you've been putting in. How does it feel that that things are the way they are? Do you just kind of accept that or just go with it? Well, as far as so I'm not this isn't business for me. This isn't that's there's a lot of fighters who talk and, and they do these things because it's a business for them and, and they need to get that fanfare. Uh, I literally don't require fans to do what I do. And, and I'm not saying that to be rude or unappreciative of my fans because I do appreciate them. Yeah. But like people who say they need fans, what they really need is the money within their fans' pockets. So I can't go into as far as to say, like, I'm not a businessman. I can't say that this needs to happen. Like you said, go into the, the real, the actual, like on paper reasons on why yeah. we should get more, or why I'm angry that we don't get paid more because I, I don't know. I don't know. As far yeah. as that goes, completely irrelevant to me, but I know that in the situation that I'm in right now, I'm not a basketball player, so I don't have the G league status yeah. to do yeah. my job. I'm, I'm a fighter. because This is what I'm good at. This is what I chose to do. Um, but it is, it, I'm not angry. I'm just desperate. I kind of mentioned it in the beginning. I, I'm not desperate to like just win every single fight. I'm desperate to get into a situation to where you're I hungry. can quit my job. And someone is saying like, hey, this is like, just know this is what you're doing for the rest of your life. Because that's all I want to do is, is do this, not for the rest of my life, for the next, yeah, you know, for six, a healthy career. Of my life. But I need someone to tell me like, hey, look, like, this is going to work out because until it does work out, until you do have that contract signed and you are doing well and you're off, you know, there's no guarantees. Yeah. There's no guarantees. I could it be is, the man yeah. right now. And then in six months time, I could be, you know, just working a regular day job with no, you know, all my hopes and dreams are gone because of whatever rhyme or reason, it just didn't shake out my favor because they didn't call me fast enough or whatever, yeah. whatever the case is, maybe I run into a, a financial rut. Yeah. Right now, I'm not promised this. Fighting not at all. Not promised. Exactly. So I'm promised the fight that's next, but I'm not fighting just for the next fight. Yes, I want to win the next fight, but that next fight is to to fund and to help me and to, to push me to that next level and to get to the real level where they can pay me to where I can quit my day job. Because could you imagine what a more in shape Jose would look like? You know, more time to put into the gym you know, more time for the wrestling, you know, like those habits that I need to develop for one fighter, you know, oh, Issa Dalapash throws a nasty right hand. Now I have twice the time in each day to prepare, you know, slipping or blocking that right hand. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just disparity. It's desperate. I'm desperately yeah. trying to get there. And I think that desperation, I felt it before and, and it makes me dangerous. It does make you dangerous and it makes you hungry. And another thing is, uh, on the flip side of that whole argument with the pay, MMA is one of the few careers and professions that's, well, it's not 100% merit-based, but in a lot of the ways it is. You know what I mean? Like, your destiny is is literally in your hands. It is literally in your body. It's whatever. And there's a lot of chance that goes into a fight. You know way more than I do. I mean, the split-second things that can go wrong. but for the large part, you can shape your career with your performance. And of course, you'll find you'll find people that are better than you that night. But it's it's one of those things that if you go on a 10 fight run right now, I would say that you have one or two more fights. But let's just say you fight 10 more times in the next couple of years and you knock everybody out. There's no way that you would not be getting calls. There's no way you wouldn't be getting offers. And um I, I understand. I, I really appreciate you being so open about everything and being so genuine, you know, because I think more people need to understand that it is a very, very hard and unforgiving game at the low levels. There's no 
like you said, there's no guarantee. You you don't have anything written in paper that says, Jose, if you keep having this this whole double life, basically, of work, family, and fighting, it will pay off. Nobody knows that, you know? And that that's a scary thing, but it also says a lot about your character and the fact that you believe in yourself, you believe in what you can do, and you have such a love for the game that this is what you're going to devote your life to. So we'll move on here. Um, let's talk about that banana split submission, man. You don't see those. It was 2020 against Jacob Dorman at CFFC 91. Talk about that night. W were you looking to hit that or were you just flowing out there? What what happened, man? So another thing, if you look at my record, I, I don't fight tomato cans. I don't fight guys who have like not so great records. Yeah. But at that point, I had fought uh, my first pro fight and for CFFC, it went my way. I got the guy out in two minutes and... I was like hearing that they were going to call me back, but again, it's not a hundred percent merit based. So yeah. I'm not really from like a big prominent gym. I'm a nobody that knows nobody, at least no one notable quite yet. And, um, I was, wasn't getting a call back yet for that. Yeah. Next and, and I was feeling that same way, that same like burning I have in my stomach yeah. right now since this big gap has happened. It was already happening. And, um, and I had me on social media begging to be on the December card, which is the card that I ended up getting on. We were begging to get on that card on social media. My coach was reaching out. I had my friends and some of my family also commenting on their posts uh, for the promotion. Like, we need to say, we need to see Jay Squaw. We need to say Jose. You know? Yeah. And um, I wasn't getting a call back. They had a guy fall out against Jacob Dorman. Uh, Caparera or some Capara, I don't yeah. know what saying, but <laughs> he was one of the East, East Coast guys. He was going to fight Jacob Dorman, and he caught COVID or something or whatever happened, and and I'm drinking beer on the Sunday before. No uh, way. Taco Man, it was my friend's uh, son's first birthday, so I was having a good old time, and Dang. we get the call that, like, hey, dude, do you want to you wanna fight this Saturday? And what a, at that point, I didn't have anything lined up, um, not right away. So we took the fight. We said, yeah, uh, struggled to make the weight really quickly, get my medicals done really fast, because even though we had lapsed at that point. So it was really just a free-for-all to try to get things done. Yeah. And, uh, get back on the show. Wow. I did not know that was on – I did not know that was on a week's notice. You did that yes. on a week's less notice. Than a week. Less than a week. Less than a week, and you were less drinking beers, eating some tacos when you got the call. Yes. Dude, yes. oh, my I God. No way, I was in no way expecting a call because I, I had been <laughs> begging them. I had been begging them. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I kind of looked at the record, and I saw some of his shortcomings, and I just knew that, like, I could – do whatever I wanted to. And I, yeah. uh, no offense to Jacob Dorman, I love you, but if you're, <laughs> you're not watching it, but if you are, yeah. I love you. Um, <laughs> but I just knew that I could do, you know, have my way. I knew I, I knew it was going to go my way. So it was one of those things that was in my mind. And I told my coach and them, I'm like, hey, we're going to get it to the ground. It's going to happen fast. And uh, just let me know when there's about a minute and a half left. Because yeah. that move, it could happen really fast. If they don't know what's going on, which ended up being the case, or if they do know, they're going to fight you like hell just for the pride of fact, like, no, I'm not going out with that. Yeah. And uh, take a minute to hit. So I knew I needed about a minute and a half just in case to play with to finish that fight. Yeah. Uh, so I kept telling my team, I'm like, there's a minute and a half left. You let me know. Because, yes, I did plan on hitting that move. I was hitting it in the gym all the time. Wow. It's just one of those moves for me that some people do it just jokingly, but actually, that move is there all the time. If you watch like kind of the way I take the back and stuff like that, it's always an option. It's just one of those yeah. things where like, I got to wait till people forget about it to hit it again. Yeah. But it was there. I knew I could get it. I got it and couldn't ask for a better turnout <laughs> because I needed, I needed to, to really show something. Yeah. To get myself back on that stage, you know, to really like open their eyes. Cause apparently a two minute finish didn't have them. Uh, 
I'm yeah. too thrilled about me yet. So another <laughs> two minute finish with a banana split, I guess, turned around. Yeah, it just took a banana split coming off the couch from drinking Dude. some beers and eating tacos. I had to work no on water for them to, uh, to get that call back, bro. I had to. Yeah, that is that is honestly insane, man. And I'm talking to you right now, and I'm like, dude, there is not more of like a like I'm sure there is, but you're so marketable and you're so good talking to people and things like that. It's like, how how does it take um, all this desperate call outs and things like that? And then the banana split to, to fully put you in their attention. You know, they should have their eyes more open than that, dude. I don't talk, man. I don't talk yeah. enough. I don't scream yeah. after I win. Look at the promotions and look at what they show. Look at the videos that they share. Yeah. I'm not promotable. I mean, I guess I am now. If I have a top tier level opponent, then I really get to shine. I really get to show my stuff. Yeah. But if I'm just fighting someone that they don't know and there's no context to how good my opponent is, you don't know yeah. because I'm not screaming. I'm not super muscular. I'm not tatted on my neck. I don't look right. frightening. But yeah. I just feel that I don't need to do that. Like I said, I'm not in this just for the business, you know? You're in it because you're a fighter. And is so we'll touch on that real quick. Is that just a personality thing or is that just like a conscious decision you're making of like, I'm going to let my fighting speak for me? All of this talking stuff is new generation. Yes. Yeah. This, this WWE level promotion of people hating each other and having some artificial like problem with each other is completely ingenuine. And that's just like to sell the fights. And, and I just believe that at the end of the day, yes, we love the buildup and we get that suspense to like watch these fights. But at the end of the day, if the fight sucks, then yeah, wh who remembers it? Who cares? Yeah, um, I figure you know you're all sides. You got this huge salad and all these side dishes, but like your main dish is just hot garbage. That's that's not the way I want to do it. I, I'm I'm all meat and potatoes. No <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No side yes. dishes. All I mean, meat just, potatoes. I'm from a different generation. Like when I was watching fighting, it was completely different fighters and they just didn't act like that. It wasn't necessary. Now, if it's genuine and I really don't like someone, just like I'm being genuine with you right now, if I genuinely don't like someone, I'm genuinely going to tell them that, hey, yeah. dude, forgive my French for your show, bud, but hey, dude, fuck you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, we don't mind. We'll, we'll drop plenty of F-bombs during this call. <laughs> All right, awesome. Hey, so um, let's talk about your last bow. I have a couple quotes I've pulled from your social media. You are a very wise and deep dude, and we will get into those soon. But Paul Capado, Capaldo, <laughs> you right. lost, that was your last fight. Topology is calling it one of the 50, the best top 50 fight of the year so far. I mean, that fight was just a war. Talk about like your emotions during the fight. Like, did you have to, did you find yourself having to push past, like, a wall that, during that fight? Or was it just all being out there and letting it all hang? Like, describe. Yeah, dude, I, I pushed past the wall, like, right before the fight, like, in the locker room, right before the fight. So, me, I, like, like I said, this isn't just business for me. This is, like, martial arts. So, every yeah. fight looks different. And they're only two months apart. You know, that's kind of been, like, the recurring themes. They've happened so fast. But all of my fights are only about two Two and a half months apart. Yeah. Every fight looks different. Every fight looks different. Go watch two of my fights. Look at Jose when I was in October fighting Issa Dalapaj. And then look at me again, you know, two months later when I was – for three months later when I was fighting Capaldo. Yeah. I'm not a different fighter, but I looked like it. My approaches were different. You hear my munchkins? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I looked like it. And uh, that's – like, I'm emotion-based, if that makes sense. I'm not saying that I'm, like – you know, well, I, I guess I am saying that I'm pretty emotional even in the fight, yeah. but um, the feelings I have leading up to the fight definitely take a part on like what ends up happening in the fight and the kind of fighter that I am, my aggression level and basically all those kinds of things. So I knew that I actually seem to do best because Issa Dalapaj is a big member out there in that company. And like, at least as far as I should say, his team is a big member out there in that company. Yeah. So I knew that I was pushing for him. And I had an amazing performance in Capaldo even more so just because I watched his fight in April right before that fight. And um, and I could just hear the way they were talking about him and the way they were looking at things that that I was picked to lose. No offense. I don't really care. But um, I think almost being on the B side and having people doubt me really like pushes me and, and yeah. almost makes a fighter out of me. And I just knew that 
at the end of the, at the at its core, all of this is no one ever takes a fight if they think they're going to lose. Everyone thinks they're going to win. So if this guy thinks he's going to win and this guy thinks he's going to win, someone's got to be wrong and someone's got to be right. So at yeah. its core, that's what it is. I'm a fighter. He's a fighter. He thinks he's going to win. I think I'm going to win. I'm right. And that motherfucker's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it was even better to have literally all of Jersey <laughs> in there yelling at me. He ain't Jersey. Like, I love that. I love making a silent crowd. I love it. It's it's the best feeling. Yeah. It's, it's the greatest. Dude, so um, do you think – that there is uh, any type of bias towards a guy from a smaller gym like yourself. Uh, you're from G2 MMA, right? Gilbert's, it's a Gilbert's yeah. Jiu-Jitsu, and Gilbert's you've also grappling. trained at Talon's Boxing, right? Well, Gilbert's Grappling, and we also have, uh, it's actually a free boxing gym, which is right. really cool. He's free? like, just Are a you couple serious? over. Dude, I'm and, about to um, move over. <laughs> right? Hey, come on, yeah. man. And he's good. Dude. He's really good. Um, and he really only trains guys who are like serious about what they're doing, and yeah, he comes out and corners them too. But, but wow. yeah, I do. To be honest with you, um, so there was at one point, so I got in, and then I started winning fights and opened their eyes to me. And then once they opened up their eyes to me, they're not just looking for one fighter; they're looking for gyms, which yeah, they opened up the door to my uh, to my teammates. So in one night, I had Isaac Watkins, who's only nineteen a 155 or he goes up a weight class to 170 and fights another guy from East of Dallapage gym that, uh, Enzo Gracie Philly. So yeah. again, we already knew. It's Steve like Hart a gym, like a gym war. Okay with that. And, um, Bo, same thing, fighting another guy from their gym. And this is the fight right before I was fighting Jalen Reed. It was my fourth fight. Dude. And, uh, I think they were pushing for me. I don't think that they were really pushing for Bo and Isaac quite as much. Yeah. Um, uh, Isaac ended up <laughs> winning pretty decisively. And like I said, that was up a weight class. Um, and then Bo didn't win. It didn't shake out in his favor. And that was the fight right before mine. But then in my post-fight interview, it was CM Punk was talking about how all of my teammates had lost already. And I'm like, no, nah, dude, they literally had this all pre-scripted because they had like, they already had it in their head how this was going to play out. They already yeah. knew like, what they were expecting. They were expecting G2 to go, Oh, or uh, one and oh, two, three, you know? yeah, something like that. Yeah. One and two, yeah. So I actually had to correct them in the interview. Uh, hey, so on social media, I've seen that you've coached BJJ classes and you've cornered your teammates. Are you interested in like a potential coaching career down the road, teaching oh, judicial that's, classes? One hundred percent, the goal. I think that's yeah. every fighter's goal. Um, so I love the sport and like i said i'd like to do it for the rest of my life and i mean that but as i also kind of correct myself maybe six or seven years where i'm doing it and then i'd like to kind of pass the torch down to someone else and and teach them and i'd like some of the guys that i met through g2 to kind of be a part of my gym if, if you know if i ever could you know like hey another coach is always helpful and that's the goal that's the only way that i really can do this forever yeah people do it all right Okay, so we have about 10 minutes before the meeting has ended here. So I'm going to go with some quick questions here because I had some really amazing quotes I wanted to hit. Um, your loss in 2021, it's the only loss on your professional record. It, it was very short and sudden. And you had this really deep quote about it. You said, my loss took away everything I had to fear and my inhibitions with them. Fuck you. I'm walking forward that that's amazing and and talk about that no fear you're hungry did that loss kind of um erase any anxiety about losing because i know with an uh an undefeated record there's that whole i want to keep my goose egg type vibe that I, anybody would have that you know let's talk about that real quick i mean well i always knew that so before my career even started i was training under miguel torres for most of my life and Miguel Torres is one of the greatest fighters, in my opinion, and he had a similar style to me minus the wrestling. So yeah. I just feel that I'm kind of a second coming and, and can kind of do things better. He fell from the knockout, and I watched that. I watched his career go up. I watched his career go down. I watched the whole thing kind of play out, and I just was really frightened and really scared that that same thing would happen to me. So I was afraid of the knockout. That was the only thing I was scared of. Even before I got knocked out, I 
told my teams like, you know, like, oh yeah, that's the only thing I don't want to happen. That's the only way I can lose. That's the only, everything in, in, in the fight game is structured. If you do this, you end up in this position and everything makes sense. You know, if you're slipping this way, you're usually hit, but you don't know how hard that punch is going to land or what effect it's going to have on your brain. Right. So that's chaos in a perfect system. That's the only like loophole. And I was so afraid of it that I would drill so much to like not let it happen. I almost think that in the fight, that fear of it happening is like. It's big, isn't it? It, it, it makes a big difference. But yeah, yeah, once I got knocked out and I got knocked out exactly the way I didn't want to get knocked out fast <laughs> and on my face, dude. Yeah. Horrible, horrible, horrible. a dark place. Yeah. Like, getting past that. What it left? What was left? What What did I have to be afraid of? Because yeah, that just took it all away. There was nothing left to be scared of. Like the worst thing happened, and then I bounced right back. Issa Dalapaz was yes. two months after that. Issa Dalapaz yes. was a knockout puncher. And now you're riding two you know, glorious victories, and you've got nothing but up to look forward to. And and another beautiful quote that you had that I wanted to touch on. Um, you said, "I use fighting to balance myself. I haven't fought in a while." I've got a lot of ugly I need to let out so that I can be beautiful again. I mean, that is very deep. And talk about that ugly you've got inside of you and tell me, do you have a chip on your shoulder or are you more just the type of guy who loves to throw down and let out any pent up anger and frustrations in there? Or is it just the, the love and passion that you've said you have for the game? Dude, there's, there's two Jose's and it sounds crazy. It's so honest. So like right now I'm in a transitional period. So I started creating this like portion of myself for this like mental entity in my mind when I was a kid and I was just smashing it in tournaments. I was just the ruler of my own world, you know? Yeah. There was a period of time where I stepped away. It wasn't super long, but you you can't act like a fighter 24 seven when you go to school or when you go to work. Like I can't act like a hard ass at work. That just doesn't, yeah. that doesn't work. Yeah. That's not possible. So <laughs> exactly. I more aggressive side of me and a more docile kind of domestic side of me and even more so i have female daughters so yeah, me too. Me like too. sensitive to they're really sensible as far as like emotions go i can't fake if i'm not happy i can't fake it they'll feel it you know what i'm saying so yeah i had to learn how to be really docile and kind of like communicate with them in a great way so i have this entity it never changed that i still had this portion of me that wanted to kill everything <laughs> and <laughs> be the man and say fuck you and and and, and just be aggressive you know that's yeah. a part of the male trick that's a male characteristic that oh yeah in today's society is almost like outdated like that we don't hunt for our food anymore that there's no yes. way to push that aggression and most yeah. people just tuck it away and just hide it for the past year and a half two years i've been able to let that dog out once every two months one weekend even the even the little half of the week leading up to the fight completely different person i talk and act different nothing affects me it doesn't mean i'm walking around angry all day right it just means i'm so i exude this confidence i exude this feeling yeah almost being able to be that aggressive makes me like not want to be if that makes sense no i know and even the way i talk and exchange with people on fight week is completely different and it's just been a really long time yeah. I haven't been able to let that dog out in a while. It doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that motherfucker's sitting in there hungry as hell, and I can't do anything to feed it because we got to figure out who the hell I'm fighting, who's going to get it. Right. It really helps me to just kind of have a name and a target to direct all my time and energy. In. Dude, I, I need it. I need yeah, it. dude. We'll have to do this again sometime, dude. You're, you're an incredible interview. I, I love how genuine you are and, and just how vocal you are with – your feelings and your thoughts because dude i think it's important for guys to be more in touch with that and i i mean i've trained i did boxing karate a little bit of jujitsu i mean you're obviously a fighter but you're in touch like with your emotions you're not afraid to talk about them i think men in general need to be more open to that not saying we need to be more emo but if if we're feeling a certain type of way i think more people should talk about it the way you do that's something oh, I right. really, men, men yeah. are not allowed to feel or they anything they, we just feel like when men are embarrassed get rejected by a girl you're embarrassed you feel embarrassed that's the emotion you're feeling yeah what do they usually do they get angry they get scared what do they do they get angry just men yep. have a tendency to feel that they can't feel any other emotion outside of the realm of what's masculine aggressive and angry you know and and it's just you're gonna die of a heart attack when you're 30 what yeah you act like that 
Yeah, and um, real quick, another beautiful quote you had. This one's also very deep. So remember when you were a kid and you put on headphones and es to escape. Now imagine the place you used to escape to was within reach. Stepping back isn't even a passing thought. Talk about that. You're so well, close to reaching your goal of making it into the UFC. How does that feel? The hard work seems to be paying off, but as you know, there's so much more hard work left to do. It doesn't pay off till it pays off, dude. I'm super close, but I'm super yeah. far. But I, you, those kids who walk around with their headphones, they're, they're angry kids or they're feeling something. They're going through a same thing, a transitional period in their life where they're trying to figure out their place in the world. They're confused and they escape and they go be who they want to be in their own mind. I still do. do it. I, if you listen to any other interviews, I talk about daydreaming in the car. That's my adult equivalent. I'm on my way to work and I don't get to put my headphones on. I'm in the car by myself. I can listen to whatever I want to listen to and just be whoever I want to be and think about whatever I want to think about. Now, since I was a little kid, like I said, I dreamed of being in the UFC. I dreamed of doing what, you know, I've always wanted to do. I, I love that. I love fighting. I think that this is my place in the world. I think this is where I shine brightest. And it's right there. It's right there. Like I said a minute ago, it's so close, but it's yes. so far. So any moment can take that away. If I fail, if I falter and make one false move, in that cage that it's going to be gone or it's going to be way further. Yeah. So, dude, no, I'm not <laughs> ready to, I'm ready to, I'm yeah. not, I'm ready to die. I don't want to say that because my family <laughs> watches these things, but I am yeah. not going to, I'm not going to step dude, back. Dude. That's what it takes though. That's it what it takes. Think, I don't even think about it. It never yeah. crossed my mind. People yeah, start man. looking for way outs when shit gets hard in there. No, no, let's keep going. And so, um, I didn't get to cover everything I wanted to cover with you. We only have a minute and 30 left, but is there anything, Dude, you any can give me shout outs? questions and I'll fill the whole thing. Oh uh, yeah. Is there any, is there any shout outs you want to give uh, to your team sponsors? Uh, is there any message you'd like to say to Dana White and, and Mick Maynard about a potential DWCS shot? Dude, I'm watching the, okay, Dana White, I'm watching who you're putting on the contender series and if you click on their record and you see who they fought, it's 100% padding. Right. Let's not turn MMA into boxing. I know that we have our favorites and we'd like to set them up to win. But at the end of the day, you still got to let in the guys who are just genuinely plain old talented. Yes. That's my only message. Let's not turn this into boxing. Yes. Let's not pad everybody's records. Let's not bring in tomato cans and give them opportunities that should have been given to people who are genuinely talented. I just feel that I'm better than those guys. Right. And all right, Jose, we have less than a minute, so I'm going to have to say goodbye. It was awesome talking to you, man. We'll do it again one day soon. And um, you're awesome, dude. Peace out, guys. I appreciate it, McCall. You have a good day, okay? Thank you, man. You too. Bye-bye.